a story is told from the Jewish Hasidic tradition of a man who was very stupid. When he got up in the morning, it was so hard for him to find his clothes that at night he almost hesitated going to bed, thinking of the trouble he would have in the morning. But one evening, one evening, he considered that he might make a change for great effect. So he took a pencil and a piece of paper, and as he undressed, he carefully noted where he put everything he had on. Next morning, feeling very good about himself, he took that piece of paper and he read, cap, and there it was, and he set it on his head. Pants, there they lay, and he got into them, and so it went until he was fully dressed. That's all very good, he said, but, but where am I myself? Where in the world am I? He asked with great consternation. He looked and looked, and his search was in vain. He could not find himself. Perhaps the man was not so stupid after all. Distracted, yes, but smart enough to know that life was more than what he could see. It was more than these clothes that caused him such worry. Perhaps there was a place in the world where he could shed his distracted self. That, that place, that place where he could find a life. But where in the world could he find himself? Where in the world am I? And perhaps that is the universal question. As a Catholic Benedictine sister and a member of a monastic community, I can tell you uh, my place in the world. I live on the prairie overlooking a horizon where a cemetery cross and a bell banner signal a particular way of life in that particular place with those particular women. Each of us makes a promise to seek God together in community by listening to God's word and by claiming our solidarity as a community in this time and in this place. Now, there is not an escape clause with that promise, no means of turning away when things get hard. But there is a remarkable history of our foremothers, Benedictine women who have lived the life joyfully through the ages. And that lifelong commitment to be for others and to be for the world is our unique promise of stability. Now, when people ask me what I was going to speak about today, and I say stability, they look at me like, whoa. I mean, what's attractive about living with the same people in the same place for a lifetime? <laughs> well, it's an amazing path. It frees us to explore our place, to send down roots, to grow in self-awareness, to grow in our care for each other, and to witness to the world the life of God. Now, I should mention that not all monastics spend a lifetime in one place, but there is that kind of connectedness that comes if they are called to a new setting, to serve new people. And that connectedness is not a shallow arrangement. It's a stability of heart that calls them back to their original community. In our time, in our mobile technology-driven society, we thrill. We thrill in our connectedness to the internet, which continually opens up new places, new opportunities, new ideas. And as the world becomes more connected, it seems that our lives become more fragmented. We're driven in so many different directions that we lose our sense of time and place. And so I ask, where is the person brave enough to stay in one place long enough to discover that they have an inner life, that they are more than a consumer, more than an aimless pedestrian, more than a tech addict? Perhaps some of you have read or heard of the world's most connected human being, and that he decided to do a 25-day detox. Here's what he wrote later. The greatest gift I gave myself was a restored appreciation 
for disengagement, for silence, for emptiness. And then he went on to say, unoccupied moments are beautiful, and I'm beginning to schedule them. <laughs> We've plugged in everywhere, but not in the world around us. What does it take? Well, it takes an emptiness. It takes those quiet moments. It takes a letting go of our distractions and our preoccupations to enter into a new place of connectedness. Quoting from my favorite little Hallmark book, now we must stop here and wait for our souls to catch up with our bodies. I think that's a definition of a retreat or a vacation. When we slow down and when we commit to staying, we find that place of our centeredness, the quiet within. We find the God who dwells within. And it is from that spiritual foundation that we wake up. We wake up and we begin to heed the human needs that go beyond our own. And we're moved to act compassionately in our burdened and tired world. The more selfless we are, says one observer, the more fearless we become in our sense of responsibility. The less self-absorbed we are, the more fearless we become in our sense of responsibility. Inspired by Joan Chittister, a Benedictine, I would suggest that stability does not stand in opposition to mobility. It stands in opposition to denying our responsibility for each other. Stability is a connectedness to a community. It's a commitment to be for others, to serve. It's an identity with these people in this place. A disconnect from our cell phone or our iPad makes possible a reconnect with those around us, with family, with our community, with our coworkers. And we need those places. We need those relationships where we are known and accepted, where we are held accountable, where we are inspired and transformed, and where we feel at home. One author has said that we yearn for home so that our soul can be at peace, but we do everything to keep ourselves spiritually homeless. It's, it's hard to honor home when we're constantly looking for something else, continually looking for something better, something more perfect, something faster, something more convenient. And it breeds a restlessness. It breeds a dissatisfaction within us that forces us, it forces us to live at the surface. But stability rewards us with deep connections to community. It rewards us with even that drive, that commitment to build community and to find a home within our global community. The challenge is to be fully present to those around us, to engage face to face with one's child, with a colleague, with a neighbor, even that person who may not be in our circle of friends. Are we ready to be fully present? Are we ready to give our time as gift? Are we ready to listen with an open heart and an open mind? I'm haunted by the words of William Isaacs who says, we don't listen, we just reload. Hearing, hearing the words of another, hearing their whole truth takes sacrifice. It takes extending ourselves it takes an expression of love. The quality of presence, says the Buddhist teacher, determines the quality of life. Sister Elizabeth has been a member of our community since its beginnings, and she would proudly tell you that in two weeks she will be 101, and that she has taught and tutored children for 67 years. 
one morning, I'm having breakfast with Sister Elizabeth, and um, I'm getting ready to leave, so I'm kind of teasing her, and I said, Sister Elizabeth, thank you for being such a great model of monastic life. There was this little pause. She said, now that I think about it, that's about all I've got to do today. <laughs> Living her promise of stability has given Sister Elizabeth a wisdom and an inner peace that creates bonds of connectedness with every person she meets. It's a still point of mutual respect and recognition. I think Sister Elizabeth would tell us that community is not instant, that it takes patience, that it takes a lifetime of living together in physical proximity. It takes being fully present to each other, in prayer and common table, and that to be for others, to be for the fullness of creation, to be for the world, is a commitment to selfless service. Connectedness, commitment, service. It's not a guarantee. But it is a way to find ourselves and a way to answer the question, where in the world am I? Thank you.